It's so good to be here and worship together on Mother's Day. It's good to have a time to set aside to think about your mother, isn't it? Remember what you're thankful for, what she's done for you, a lot of good things. Um, it's a hard job being a mother, right? I mean, I gave my mother a run for her money. So, and I know some of you are hard cases, you did the same. One of the struggles I think that mothers have, parents have, is um, letting go of your kids. I mean, everything inside of a mother wants to protect her children, to keep them close, to keep them under the shelter, to, to guard them. And, and yet, we all know that what we're trying to do is to make them independent and eventually uh, push them out of the nest and let them live on their own. There's that tension between those two things of wanting to guard and protect, but also wanting to allow them to grow up. And I think that gets especially hard as they begin to reach that edge of adulthood and you're really beginning to let go. And uh, maybe nobody said this better than an old Spice advertisement that I think is hilarious. So I want to show you how they portray this tension that mothers have. Didn't see it coming, but it came in a can. Now my sweet son's right into a lair. <laughs> Sarah Pearson had on her Facebook page this week. Sarah used to be here with us, and her husband was our minister of youth. They have a fifth grade daughter, and Sarah wrote, Tips for the mom going on the fifth grade field trip tomorrow. I think Emma gave her these. Number one, be outgoing, but not too outgoing. Like, hi guys, but not, hi guys. Because <laughs> that's embarrassing. <laughs> Number two, we have to play cool music in the car, but not too loud and no dancing. No, Mom, seriously, none. Number three, also, no singing. Number four, if you see my friends being rude, don't discipline them. Let Mrs. Wagner take care of it. If the boys are rude, you can yell at them. See, lots of rules. And the, the fifth one, which every parent needs to remember, is don't hug me or talk about me at all. Especially no kissing me. Yeah. It's tough being a mom. It's a lot of rules to remember. And they change as time goes by, so just be prepared. So, what would you say is the greatest gift your mother ever gave to you? And I don't mean the kind that comes in a box that you can buy. I mean, Something you learned, something that you were taught, some kind of character. Some of you, um, when, when you think about your mother, you have tons of happy memories, and it's easy to think of things you're thankful for. But, but I know some of you didn't know your mothers well, or when you think back, you remember strife and problems. But even then, even then, I think that you can look back and see that God has taught you things and shaped you and made you a better 
person, he's developed character in you because of, even because of problems you've had. It's good to stop and remember what's happened in your life because of your mother. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul wrote uh, two letters that we have to Timothy. Now, Timothy was his spiritual son, is what he calls him. At the time that Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison. Timothy was in Ephesus, where he was one of the leaders of the church in Ephesus, which was a major church in the day. <clears throat> so, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he brings up a kind of a... <laughs> something that I want us to take a look at this morning. He's been giving thanks for Timothy, uh, remembering Timothy, and he, breaking into it in verse, chapter 1, verse 5. He says, I've been thankful for you, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure it's in you as well. Now let's hold it there for a minute. See, the mother's gift. A mother's gift could be many different things, but one of the greatest things that a mother can do is to sow the seeds of faith in her child's life. And that's what we see here with, with Timothy. In, in fact, Paul knew his family history quite well. They had traveled together for several years. He, he knew his mother and apparently his grandmother. And he, he looks back and says, you know, you have the faith. Started with your grandmother and it was passed to your mother and from them to you and I like to think it was both mother and grandmother that were building into uh, Timothy building that faith into him and, and so Paul remembers this he's mindful of this sincere faith which was in Timothy that came through his grandmother and his mother and uh, he gives thanks for that I was thinking of how often when we have baptisms here and people tell their story before the congregation, the story of how they came to know Jesus as Savior, how often part of that story is wrapped up around their mother. Mothers have a huge spiritual impact on their children and can really plant these seeds of faith. So how do you do that? How do you plant those seeds? Well, first of all, Teach your child the word. That's what they did with Timothy. If you look over in chapter 3, just turn the page. Chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, Paul writes, You, however, <clears throat> continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. They had taught him the word of God from childhood. It's, man, if you can start then, that, that's the best time to start. The younger the better. Teach them the, the word of truth. The word of God. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm probably like about half the room today. <clears throat> Lots of allergies this week, it seems like. And so I've got a cough drop, but sorry, I hate for you to have to listen to that. I think of what this means. Any of us can do this, children, right? You can do it with your children. Starting when they're little, but, but even as they get older, remind them, teach them, train them in the Word of God. He says, uh, remember, he, he reminds Timothy, remember these things you've learned all the way from childhood, and remember who you learned them from. And I think that's significant. That Timothy can look back and remember that this most important thing in his life, his faith he has received, came originally from his grandmother and his mother, those who loved him, who were close to him, who cared for him. Later he heard it reinforced through the Apostle Paul and, and others as well. Remember who you heard it from. And then hold on to it. You see it? Continue in the things you've learned and become convinced. That's good advice for us, isn't it? Continue in the things you learned and were convinced of. Don't give it up. Don't quit. You don't have to stop asking questions. Do not stop learning. 
but don't drop it. Don't give it up. Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. Remember who you learned it from. This came from the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Hey, that's the constant teaching in the New Testament and really throughout the scripture. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Let's go back then to chapter 1. So he is saying, you can sow the seeds of faith, starting by teaching the word, and then live it out. Live it out before them. Children know that you're not perfect, and it doesn't take too long to figure that out. But it's not about perfection. It's about just simply trying to practice what you preach. And in fact, when you do fail, that's a great teaching opportunity as well, because your children will fail, and they need to understand how to do that and what it means. Live it out. Live it out. You know, and um, something that ought to be encouraging to a lot of us is occasionally we get discouraged or down thinking, well, my marriage isn't the greatest, my life isn't the greatest, our home isn't the greatest, my kids are probably not, and you can get, he has started thinking, if it's not, if everything's not just right, you're doomed, and it's not true. Here in Timothy's case, for instance, all the way back when we first meet him in the book of Acts chapter 16, it tells us that Timothy's father was not a Christian. It says he was a Greek. So you have this emphasis that his mother knew the Lord, but his father did not. You don't have to worry that everything at home isn't just perfect. There's probably two people in here who had almost a perfect home, and the rest of us, <laughs> well, we got here, didn't we? <laughs> Let God work. You do what you can do, and trust God. You, you look to Him. You sow the seeds, and let God bring the harvest. Let God do the work. He'll do that. He'll work through you, even in your imperfection. Trust Him. And ultimately, it is your children who will choose. You sow the seeds. But they make their choices. You can't control everything. It'd be nice. It doesn't work that way. It wasn't a perfect home at Timothy's house. No, it wasn't at your house either, I don't suppose. But here he is, one of the great men of Scripture. Keep sowing the seeds of faith. And what did your mother plant in your life? Maybe she planted the seeds of faith in your life. If you stop and think, what am I most thankful for? Maybe it's that. Maybe it's a great sense of humor. You remember lots of laughs in your house. Maybe she was a cook. She might have helped you discover art. What did you get from your mother? What are you really thankful for? I want you to do something right now. In your bulletin, You've got a, a flower. Did you see that? Somebody pull one out. Yeah. Can I have that please? <coughs> Thank you. So they're all different colors. It's a little sheet of stiff paper like this. It's got a tulip on it. And it says, thanks, Mom, on the top of the tulip, right? I want you to take a minute and to write something you're thankful for about your mother on this. Uh, if, she, if you don't have a pen, there are some pens in the little pocket in the backs of the chairs. Uh, and I think we've got some extras of these, like there's uh, some ushers that have extras if you need one, and you can have your spec Thanks a lot. And I'm going to just wait for about 72 seconds and let you write. One Mississippi. You can write on the front, you can write on the back. Several of you can write on the same one if you want to. And then hang on to it. I'll tell you what to do with it later. All right. 
72. Yeah, this is it. Um, you can keep writing if you want, but we're going to go on. Because I want to see what Paul then says next to Timothy. You see, what he's done is recognize you started. You've got the starting point. You're at the starting blocks. You just went through the draft and you got picked, right, for you who are watching the draft. So that's where it begins. The spiritual life begins through simple faith in Jesus Christ. When we turn to him and put our trust in him, that's where it all starts. That's when our sin is forgiven. We receive God's gift of eternal life. And the, the spiritual life really begins when we trust Jesus as Savior. But that's not where it's supposed to stop. Look at verses 6 and 7. For this reason, the reason is, he's remembering this faith that's in Timothy. And he says, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. <clears throat> Two things he tells Timothy here. He, he really, I think if you could sum it up, he says, dive in. Come on. Get into the game. Dive in. Get going. Don't sit on the sidelines and watch. Don't think that just because you have believed in Jesus, that's enough, and you can just coast your way through life. That's the starting point. Dive in. And by the way, this summer, June and July, we're going to do a series called Dive In. Dive into spiritual growth. And we're going to go through a number of the foundational steps and look at them in a fresh way to build that foundation for going deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's going to be a good summer. So, Paul is telling Timothy this. You need to dive in. You see, Timothy, when you read the first, the first and second letters to Timothy here, you get a sense of his personality. He, was, he tended to be timid, to hold back, to be a watcher. I mean, he faced a lot of opposition in the church and in culture. And he didn't like that conflict, apparently. He, he, had, he got stomach aches because of it. Paul tells him, hey, you take care of your stomach. He had issues because of the stress and the problems. But Paul says, look, you need to dive in. You need to get involved. In fact, he says, first of all, you use your gift. Kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Look back in chapter or 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 14. Here he describes it in his first letter to Timothy also. Do not, it's 4, 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery or the, the leaders of the church. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Then he repeats that same thing in 2 Timothy. Kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. Timothy had this tendency to want to step back and, and watch and let others do it, I think. And Paul said, you dive in. God gave you a gift. It is a spiritual gift. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he put his spirit within you. And that Spirit of God, that Holy Spirit, has bestowed upon you one or more spiritual gifts. It may use your natural abilities or talents or gifts, but there is a supernatural element when the Spirit of God works in you through a spiritual gift. And every one of us have spiritual gifts through Jesus Christ. When you trust Christ, the Spirit of God is, is put within you, and He bestows upon us. Spiritual gifts. For instance, one of the spiritual gifts mentioned in Scripture is service. Now, we're all supposed to serve, right? And, and most of us do that because we should do that. We, we do it because we are needed or we should do it out of a sense of duty. But a lot of us would rather be doing something else. <laughs> but those who have a gift of serving... There's a certain joy and satisfaction in doing that. They don't have to be told what to do. They see a need and they meet it. It doesn't matter if anybody else sees it or not. They don't need anybody to thank them especially. They just have a certain satisfaction through serving because there is this, that's the way the Spirit of God is using them to build up 
the body of Christ, to build up the church. There are a number of gifts mentioned in Scripture. The gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation or encouragement. One that I love is the, the gift of mercy. In fact, it's called mercy with cheerfulness. A person who's able to come alongside and, and suffer with you and sympathize with you and yet to remain cheerful in the face of it all. There are many spiritual gifts. Do you, do you know that you have one or more? And that God wants to work through you to build up the body of Christ, the church. We have a Sunday school class, an adult class, called Growing in Grace. And uh, there's a three-week segment of that that's on discovering your gift and understanding it and learning how to use it. It's a, at least a good place to start. You might want to try that, Growing in Grace. At any rate, <coughs> excuse me, Paul reminds Timothy that he has the, he has a gift. And he tells him, use it, stir it up, kindle it up. Come on, get in there. You're equipped. You've been equipped by God himself. So get, a, get into the game. Dive in. And then he says, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power of love and discipline. If, if you are timid, if you are afraid and frightened, if you want to step back and, and stay clean and never get involved, that's not from God. The Spirit of God is the one who's prodding you to move forward, to make a difference with your life, to do something with your life. Timothy, I, re I respect Timothy and appreciate him, but I have the sense that he might have been a little bit of a whiner. <laughs> and Paul says, hey, buck up, man. Get up. Grow up. Be big. Be big. In fact, one of the admonitions to Timothy when it speaks of him, it speaks of him and from the Greek, it means little soul. One whose soul shrinks in. He says, don't be a little soul person. Be a big soul person. Dive in. Come on. Get in. And then he says in verse 8, really 8 through 13, he said you need to, to dive in to get involved. And then he says, I want you to be strong. And I'm going to give you two reasons why you ought to be strong. First of all, the admonition in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel, according to the power of God. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Be bold. And then he gives the two reasons why he should be bold. Because he is, God has saved him. And God has saved us. He says, verse 9, who has saved us? And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Look at that. He's saved us. Saved us for himself. He, he has taken us from doom, raised us up to heavenly places. His own dear children. He's given us this opportunity to be called the children of God it is an awesome thing. We are forgiven in Jesus Christ. He has saved us and called us with the holy calling. Now, I was thinking of what it means to be called. Called with the holy calling. It means called away from sin, doesn't it? I mean, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it, and ask Him to be your Savior, it's because you know you need to be saved. And that means that you understand that there are consequences to sin, to doing wrong, and, and you don't want that anymore. Now, I haven't managed to live a sinless life yet myself. If you have, see me after. <laughs> um, but there's that sense of being changed, of a, a new heart and a new desire, a, a new ideal. I, I want to be different. I don't pursue sin anymore. I want to pursue righteousness, holiness, and God. We're called from sin. We're called out of the world. Out of the world. In fact, the, 
The word church itself means a, a called out group, a called out assembly, a called out people for God. We're called out of the world, called to God, called to faith, called to eternal life. We have a holy calling. We're saved, we're called with a holy calling back in verse 9. Not according to our works. It's so natural to think that God would save us and call us because He saw how good we are. Because He saw the number of good things that we've done. All the rules that we've kept. The money that we've given. The service that we've done. But the Scripture tells us over and over, it's not because of our works. Not according to our works. But what is it? It's according to His own purpose and grace, which He carried out in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. I love that. Before the world ever was, God knew what was coming. God had the plan that He would send His Son. All through the Old Testament, before Jesus had ever died on the cross, when people believed God, believed His promise, they were saved on the basis of what Jesus would do for them at the cross, as that was in the mind of God. And now, as we, when we put our faith in Jesus, we look back on what He did. They looked forward to what He would do. We look back on what He did. And it's that faith in Jesus that saves us, not our works. It was the plan of God, the purpose of God, carried out in Jesus Christ. And He carried it out at the right time. Verse 10, but now it has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Huh, is that beautiful? Life and immortality to light through the gospel. You know what it says here that it was... The end of verse 9, it was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It reminds me of a verse in Ephesians that in the King James, it speaks of us as being accepted in the beloved. Accepted by God in Jesus Christ, His beloved Son. Here we have this. That all of what God grants to us is in Christ Jesus. It was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Everything that we have from God is through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we have all of the riches that the Heavenly Father can offer to His child. Some of you know that this week Susan and I went and visited our daughter and son-in-law in Chicago. We sort of went to visit them. Mostly we went to see their new grandson and um, had a great few days with them. But I, got, I was thinking about my son-in-law in reading this verse about all of the, uh, everything that was granted us in Christ Jesus, about being accepted in the beloved. And I was thinking about the first time she introduced him to us. See, he was not really one of us. Man, this guy was, uh, he's from Argentina, and, and he came to the States on a soccer scholarship. And you know what soccer players from Argentina look like? If you watch soccer games, you do that. They all seem to have the same hairdresser. Long, uh, really curly, kinky, black hair down the shoulders. And uh, he looked too old for my daughter. <laughs> and he was a guy. <laughs> and I wasn't too sure that I liked that so much. <laughs> but then, she loved him. And so, what do I care about hair? or accidents, or any of that. Because you see, anybody that she loves, I'm going to love. He was accepted in the beloved. 
he was accepted in my daughter. She loves him, so I love him. And anything he ever needs that I could ever do is his. That's what God's saying to us. I love you as much as I love my son, Jesus Christ. Anything that I would give to him, I would give to you. Because I offer you everything I have. In Ephesians 1, it says, All of the riches in the heavenly places have been given to us in Christ Jesus. That's where we have it all. In Christ Jesus. So it's never about our works. It's always about his work for us at the cross. Where all of our sin was taken care of. And now we simply receive the love of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, the riches of God, the blessing of God in Christ. That's the beauty of this. That's our salvation. And look at verse 12. Not only has he saved us, but... He will keep us. Paul says, for this reason also I suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day, that final day, that day I stand before him. He is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. We have laid our lives into his hands trusted everything we are and have to our loving Heavenly Father, and He is able to keep that. He will never let go. No one can snatch you out of His hand. He will keep you until that day when you stand in His presence. And that is grace, my friends. That is grace. It's the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Apart from that, we'd be lost. Thank you for your love poured out upon us through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the way you've worked in our lives in so many different ways over the years. One of those is through our mothers. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And I wanted to tell you what to do with your flower. Maybe you saw outside and just in front of the painted wall, just outside the doors here, there are a bunch of flower carts there. They're filled with sand. So we've been talking about planting the seeds of faith today, right? So when you go out, would you just plant your flower in that sand and stick it in? You'll see how it works. There's a lot of different colors, so we'll get a really colorful bouquet out of all of this. You can plant it here and remember. Remember that mama. <coughs>